Good morning. I want to welcome you here on this Lord's Day and uh, trust that we'll all be blessed as we gather in this place to worship the Lord this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Um, there's a ladies spring brunch that's highlighted there April 27th. I don't know if anything needs to be said about that. Anything? The ladies? We're good? Just show up? Can I show up? I think I should. I really should find out what goes on at those things. And then uh, I also want to note the quarterly business meeting uh, scheduled for uh, two weeks from today, April the 28th. It's immediately following the service. Um, just there's a, the last time we had a quarterly meeting, we talked about changing the fiscal year of the church, the business year from, rather from being from uh, the end of May to, or June 1st to the end of May every year, changing it to the calendar year and coinciding with that and going from January 1st to December 31st every year. So all of that, uh, we've talked about it. There's, there's a paper that I've prepared with details about it in the back. The ushers will hand it out as you leave the service today. Just the details. I know people were talking about various things, wondering how this or that's going to work. Well, it's all kind of spelled out here for you on this paper. Uh, this is all proposed. If there's discussion that needs to happen at the meeting to change some things, then we'll do it. But you have the work in progress right there. So when you're leaving today, uh, get that from the ushers and then pre uh, be, uh, mark your calendar for April 28th, um, right immediately following the service, a quarterly meeting. <clears throat> Anything else that needs to be announced this morning? Yes, Jim. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> I'm always much happier to hear that there's a lawn mowing schedule being put up than I am the snow <laughs> removal schedule. Are we, we all in agreement on that. <clears throat> Anything else? Any other announcements? All right, well, I'm going to ask you if you bow your head, please, and pray with me this morning. Father, we come here into your house this day, this Lord's day. We're thankful, Father, that we have this place to come to. We have this fellowship that we share, and we have this local body, and uh, we thank you for your abundant provisions for us and giving us this, this uh, facility to meet in and the care that, that is necessary and the, and the finances that are provided so that we can do what we're called to do here. We're mindful, Father, that as we come, we come as imperfect beings, we come as, as people who struggle, uh, people who sin, and you are fully aware of all the details of our lives. And, and you have said that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And even now I confess before you our, our failures, our struggles, but I proclaim the assurance that we have of your cleansing power and that you purify us from all unrighteousness through the blood of Jesus and we're truly grateful for that this morning. Father, I pray for this service today and all that are gathered here that uh, you'd speak to us, that you'd meet needs, that you'd challenge our hearts, that you'd encourage us. Uh, I pray for those joining us via the live stream. I, I pray the same for them, O oh God, that you would uh, meet them right now where they are, that, that they would, we're thankful for this technology and this gift 
that we can share with uh, people who are unable to be here, whether because of traveling or because of uh, affliction, illness. We pray for those who are afflicted and ill, but we pray for all who join us this morning that we do have a collective sense of your presence and your and the fellowship of the saints. And we ask God that you would move amongst us for your glory. I pray, Father, for the offerings that are brought to this house today, that you would bless those and bless those who bring them. I pray for the constant wisdom and direction in terms of the use of these funds that are given, that they might be used for the glory of your name and for the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we thank you for your tremendous blessings upon us, and we thank you for the, this service today and ask that your Holy Spirit is free to move amongst us. We, we ask God for your blessing. We ask that we bless you, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing? Oh, it all comes 
Please take your Bible and <clears throat> turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So we come now in, in Matthew 5 to what's the last two contrasts that Jesus presents in this list of six contrasts that he's... Uh, <laughs> That where he contrasts the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees with the true and deeper purpose of the intended meaning, uh, 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 the intended meaning of the particular law of Moses that he's addressing. So the Pharisees are teaching things and they're not teaching the whole story and Jesus has been offering these contrasts. So remember, I'll just take you quickly to, to the foundation again. Uh, remember the foundational building block, the first building block of the Sermon on the Mount the first beatitude, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Glorious news there. So Jesus came to forgive and save, to bless the poor sinner, the broken, the poor in spirit. He came to do that through the cross. And then he, he came also to confront the oppressive teaching of the religious leaders, the hypocrites, those in power those who were oppressing the poor in spirit. And so he, much of this Sermon on the Mount, he's, that's what he's doing. He's confronting this. And so remember verse 17, 17, he said he didn't come to abolish the law, but he, and he goes on from there to make it evident that he came to what he came to do rather than abolish the law was to apply it to the depths of the human heart and reveal the depravity in every human being and, to, uh, and ultimately to reveal the need for a savior. And then remember Romans 3, we quoted last week, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Why? Because the law, the law comes, through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's what the law does. It reveals sin. And so, and then we know that right before Jesus begins here in the Sermon on the Mount to point out these contrasts between what's being taught by the scribes and Pharisees and what the law really reveals. In verse 20, remember, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses or exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so a lot of this has been to tell us, to show us how our righteousness needs to uh, surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. And so from that point, he makes these six contrasts. And what's being taught, again, by the scribes and Pharisees and what people have understood, he contrasts that what, what, with, with what the law and the righteousness is really all about. And it's about the, the, the human heart. It's about the heart of a person. And so he's addressed, we've thought about, the, we've followed through these, he's addressed the subject of murder and anger, and he equates those two things. And then he, he addresses adultery and lust, and he equates those two things. Out of lust, we find adultery. Out of anger, we find murder. And then he, and then he addresses divorce, which, you know, the, re, the whole problem there was they were just offering a simple certificate of divorce to just about anybody who wanted one for just about any reason, which played into the lust of man because, you know, they were just disposing of wives and taking otherwise. It was a terrible oppression of women. And then he addresses uh, oaths, which falls also in the theme of the marriage vow, right? Oaths, we, we make a pledge and 
We're to honor those pledges. And we've worked through those, and we come now to these last two, the two remaining contrasts Jesus presents in terms of the law and exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It's found here in verses uh, 38 to 48. And they have to do with, this, this section has to do with retaliation and loving your enemies. And, uh, the, and it's really very connected. That's why I take them both at once here. So I want to read Matthew 5, <clears throat> 38 to the end of Matthew 5. Jesus is speaking, of course, and again he says, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile with him, go two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, uh, there's a, a lot here, and uh, I, I've tied these two sections together. Uh, there's a lot to bite off. I'm not going to be able to develop each of these scenarios that Jesus talks about here. I, I want to uh, try to summarize it for us. And uh, be, this is so, as John Stott addresses this, he says, as he addresses this last portion of the fifth chapter, he says, the final, this final contrast. These final contrasts bring us to the highest, the highest point of the Sermon on the Mount, for which it is most admired and most resented. So this, this Stott saying this point that we're at right here, highest point for which it's both most admired and most resented, namely the point being made, that namely the attitude of total love, which Christ calls us to show toward one who is evil and our enemies. Now, nowhere is the challenge of the sermon greater, and nowhere is the distinction of Christian counterculture more obvious. And nowhere is our need for the power of the Holy Spirit, whose first, love, whose first fruit is love, nowhere is the need of the power of the Holy Spirit more compelling than in the command to show love toward one who is evil and our enemies. Now, this is hard stuff. And this whole thing is, is ultimately where the rubber meets the road. I mean, if you want to get down to the ultimate essentials of Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's found right here. And love, sacrificial love, costly love, love that is not common to man, supernatural love, agape. It has its own word, agape, supernatural love. The greatest of these Paul said, is love. So we might ask Jesus. We could ask Jesus. We could do it right now. We can say, Jesus, what, what, what is the greatest commandment? What do you most desire? And you know what? He answers us. He answers us loud and clear. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. And it's not just that it's like it. It's inseparable from it. You can't have the one without the other. You can't have the first without the next. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commands, Jesus said, depend all the law and the prophets. Now, I said to you, Stott says this portion of the Sermon on the Mount that gets to this love, this issue of love. He said it's, it's the highest point and Jesus says in terms of the, the greatest commandment, there's the, everything, everything hinges, 
This, the, 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 the law and the prophets all hinge on this commandment, this love. Love your father in heaven and love your neighbor as yourself. And so <clears throat> Stott says a lot of interesting things in this portion I just read. I think interesting things regarding the teaching of Jesus on showing love toward one who's evil and toward our enemies. And uh, it's tough stuff. It's tough stuff. This is the, love your enemy, love the one who's evil. I mean that. So Stott says it's the highest point in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the it's the point for which it's most admired and most resented, and it's true. I mean, you if you search it out, you start reading what people say about this. You have people who just this is they exalt this and admire this, and in the right sense. And then there's others who really resent this. There's been those throughout history who've said, "I can believe everything Jesus said." except this whole thing about turning your other cheek. Because when somebody smacks one side of my face, I just want to knock their head off. My daughter laughed at that. <laughs> she, she thinks it's funny. Shelby, would you like to, no, never mind. <laughs> you know, so Stott says this is the highest point, most admired, most resented, and he also said that there's nowhere the power of the Holy Spirit is needed more. And I agree with both of those statements because the highest point in the Sermon on the Mount, why? Because really all of this points us to the cross of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus. And I'll, I'll get there as we go through this today, but th that's what this points to. And verses 44 and 45, it says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Why do we do that? So that we might be the sons of our Father who's in heaven, which points us to the gospel of Christ. And there's nowhere, I would say, where the power of the Holy Spirit is more needed in the Christian life or more evident than in showing love toward one who's evil or an enemy, or one who's offended us, one who's wronged us. You know, some think they like to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit by, you know, supernatural signs and wonders and visions and all manner of, fist, uh, of mystical things. But the first fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And when we find the power to love one who's done evil and to put away anger or, or love our enemies, when we find that, we're truly, we're truly tapping into the supernatural power of the Spirit. And we, and we are finding the true Christ-like nature being born in us when we do that. It ought to be the highest priority in the, in the pursuit of the Spirit. Being, being as it's Jesus, it's the greatest commandment to love this way. And so in, in that, I believe we, as, as, as we, how we do this, uh, how we love our enemies and, and how we respond to those who do evil, we really re reveal what we understand about the cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, in that, we reveal that what Jesus said in verse 45, that we're sons of our Father who's in heaven because, because this is what God has done for us. And we're like him when we love our enemies and, and, and uh, those who do evil. So I just want to turn our attention to the text and see if we can gain some understanding of what's happening here, because this is, it's, you know, what exactly is Jesus saying? i have say this has been misunderstood and mishandled in many ways, a lot of this, and I, and I hopefully it can shed some light on it, but it, it, the heading in ESV summarizes the subject matter well in these two sections. The first subject matter we'll consider in verses 40, uh, 38 to 42 is retaliation, and then in verses 43 to 48, Loving our enemies, and, the, and I was so. This is a connected theme. There's a lot here to consider. There's, and again, there's a lot that can be and has been mishandled and misunderstood. I'm going to do my best to help us all think through this, and best understand this, <clears throat> and apply what Jesus is really saying to us. I think it's 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 of the utmost importance. Look at verse 38. Jesus once again says, "You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth." And so once again, he's addressing the way that, you know, what was being said and taught by the scribes and Pharisees. You've heard this said, and, and you know, and then he offers the contrast. But I say to you, 
They say this, but I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. But, even, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. No. Once again, we really got to think about you know, what the scribes and Pharisees are doing with this command. Because, you know, it comes out of a whole other section of scripture, like, like we saw with divorce and others. You know, they, they just isolate certain things for their own use. So what, but this, this statement, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, it comes right out of the Mosaic Law. And, you know, if you go into the Mosaic Law in various places, uh, you're going to find there's a wide variety of case laws given that have a particular emphasis on, emphasis on uh, damage to peop people or persons or persons' property. And so we have these governing laws. And, and, the, and in the course of the development of these laws, you're going to find the words, these words in the Mosaic Law, where these scribes and Pharisees are taking this from in Exodus 21, 22 to 25. And this is a very, very specific law, as many of them are. Uh, but it, so it says this, when men strive together, and that's not men working together, striving, to, it's, it's actually, you know, against one another, fighting, when men strive together, fight, and they hit a pregnant woman, so that her child, ch children come out, but there's no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there's harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. So that's the whole context in which they're plucking out this whole thing about the tooth and the eye and the eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But in that, we find a key point. We find a key point. <clears throat> these penalties for these offenses, these retaliations, they're going to be determined, be determined by the judges of Israel, right? It says back there, as the judges determine. So uh, there was a legal system, and there's a, there's a right way, whether whether it be a financial penalty through a fine or whether it be some sort of corporal punishment, the judges determine that. So, but make no mistake, in this section where Jesus teaches this, he's not disarming the reality and the necessity of just retribution, legal systems. He's not, he's not dismissing that. There's no such, there's, there, there's a lot of scripture where you know, we find it validates the necessity of just retri retribution among men. And then, uh, most importantly, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Jesus said, or Paul says, I charge you in the presence of Christ and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom. So <laughs> there will be an ultimate just retribution. There will, the, the Christ is the judge, and upon that, we, we will either fall, find our righteousness in Christ through his grace and mercy, or we will suffer the just penalty of our sin. That's going to happen. And so there will be an ultimate and just retribution. Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead. In this passage, Jesus is in no way promoting lawlessness here. You know, don't, don't mess with the evil people. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not promoting lawlessness. He's not promoting that we should be doormats. But the problem, so there's a problem. And, and this is where you have to get to the bottom of this. The problem was, again, with the scribes and Pharisees and, they, and what they had done with this law. They'd extended, they extended the principle of just retribution from law courts where they belong, because God had established them. They took it and they put it in the realm of personal relationship, allowing themselves and the people to take the law under their own hands. And so when you do that, you're allowing anger and hatred and vengeance to grow. You're allowing these things to escalate, uh, to, to, to developing anger. You know, you're putting it in the hands of people, leaving the law in their own hands. And they, they use the wording, eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But they once again sold it short. They justified and promoted personal revenge. You know, they, they justified and promoted personal revenge. 
which is a terrible thing, right? Because God condemns that in so many places. And when they justified it, in so doing, while these Pharisees and scribes claim to be such keepers of the law and have such knowledge of it, they ignore completely Leviticus 19.18, where it says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So what they're doing with this whole thing is they're, 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 they're enabling strife and conflict and all sorts of things to grow amongst the people. They were promoting revenge. And uh, we know in both Old and New Testament, God forbids that. And, you know, as we read, there's some, some, some fines involved, could be involved. Which, so which, whenever there's fines involved and money changing hands, we also have opportunities for extortion. And so they were doing those kinds of things, proclaiming an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And there was, they, there was corruption involved with this, and they were missing the point entirely. And Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I'm saying it, it, that whole, the way they were handled is breeding division. It's breeding dissension among the people. But just like all the other points Jesus has made thus far about murder and adultery and divorce and oaths, they're using only part of the quote, the Pharisees, only using part of it that, that appeases them and helps them and, uh, to, to justify their own actions. And just like with all the other things, Jesus now says, but I say... But I say to you, don't resist the one who's evil. Now, people, this, this is one, that, that, that right there, that statement causes a lot of people to struggle. We really need to think about this. Jesus says, do not resist the one who's evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. <clears throat> and then right in this section, we actually have, what we have is four pictures here. Uh, four contradictions that Jesus presents to the way they were acting on the phrase eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What Jesus is teaching here is, you know, it, it's the opposite of what they were teaching and promoting. Jesus is teaching Christian non-retaliation. Christian non-retaliation, love. And he uses four examples to illustrate them, really these examples to illustrate the lengths we must go to. And as Stott points out, Jesus introduces us to four people. And each of these people have, in some sense, done evil. <laughs> uh, one slaps the cheek. One comes with a lawsuit, maybe a frivolous lawsuit. Uh, one, one forces you to go a mile and, and one begs from you. So when he says, we do not resist the one who's evil, you cannot, here's another one of these cases, brothers and sisters, you cannot isolate that verse. You know, people, I said, this is the danger of using verses. Well, Jesus says we're never to resist evil. No, is that what he says? No, that's not what he says. You have to read it all. He, he certainly, he, this is not a universal Thing. This isn't universal in terms of evil. He's not talking about the essence of evil or the totality of evil. People have taken this charge to extremes that Jesus never intended. Do you notice? <laughs> so this, just notice with me. So as he talks about, he says, you don't resist the one who does evil. Do you notice the examples he gives in terms of who's evil? Um, I mean, maybe this points us to kind of the state of things and how trivial some of the things were becoming. Because, you know, the, the, the examples of those who do evil are a slap on the cheek, a lawsuit, someone demanding you give you something, give, you know, uh, you, you give more than you want to, or someone begging from you that you might give them what you think is your hard-earned money and that you have, that they have no right to. I mean, so, so when, the point is, when he said, do not resist the one who does evil, he doesn't follow that with statements and examples of murderers and rapists and child molesters and all sorts of other extreme evil. No, look, I mean, look at these examples. Slapped on the cheek, a lawsuit, somebody asking you to go a little too far, somebody who wants to borrow something from you. 
So you got to keep it in that context. This isn't a statement on how we deal with all evil. The epistles of Paul and Peter and James constantly are telling us to resist evil and resist the devil. And, but as it's stated in the ESV, Jesus says, do not resist the one who's evil. Other translations put it, do not resist the evil person. And so we, we have to keep it in the context because we know certainly Satan is the ultimate one who does evil, and he is the ultimate personification of evil. He's the prince of darkness. And certainly we cannot possibly interpret the command of Jesus as an invitation to compromise with evil or sin or with Satan. And so the reality of what he's teaching here has to do with you know, much lesser things. than So he, it has to do with personal offenses, conflicts, irritations. The scribes and Pharisees were blowing all of this out of the proportion and giving everybody permission to retaliate for just about anything. And that's just a total mess. And so a lot of it has to do with, a lot of this, and it applies to us because it has a lot to do with what we think, what we think are our rights and our possessions. And I have the right, I, I heard somebody one day in an interview say to somebody, they said, I have the right to not be offended. What? Really? I mean, who, the right to not be offended? You can't live in any relationship without being offended. And, and, and being offended and having conflict is what grows relationship. Anyway, we, we you know, this, this has a lot to do with, with what we think we're entitled to, what our rights are. A lot of people have a huge internal struggle when we feel wronged. You know, somebody's wronged me in some way. They did this, or, or they, they, you know, and, they, and we want to settle the score. One of the worst division-causing things I've seen in, in my life as a pastor oftentimes is when somebody passes away and there's a estate involved. It's, a, it's, a, it's terrible. It turns, people, people fight. That should have been mine. And then they say, well, I'm never speaking to that person again. They did, you know, it's just, Jesus, this is the kind of thing he's addressing here. This kind of evil. And, uh, you know, we, 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 want, we want to settle the score, right? We, we, we want revenge. We want the other party to pay. I'm not speaking to that person. Jesus said, if someone slaps your face, look, it's not a nice thing. It's, it's, it's evil in a sense to a degree, and it hurts, and it stings your face. But the best thing you can do is turn the other cheek, get over it, move on, extend grace. I mean, you know, we're not talking about being hit in the head with a baseball bat here. We're talking, in the, in the time of Christ, it was, in, in, and, and to this day in the East, I understand that to be slapped on the right cheek is a humiliating and insulting thing. That's what he's talking about. And so in the Gospel of John, if you remember, Jesus is being questioned by the high priest. And one of the temple guards doesn't like what he said, so he slaps Jesus on the face. Jesus didn't then retaliate. He didn't get up and beat the man. He didn't call down a thousand legions of angels to destroy him. He did have a few questions for him. But the reality is the statement Jesus, when he makes to, to turn the other cheek when slapped is as much figurative as it is literal. I mean, it's a picture having to do with when a Christian endures insults and offenses, when we're disrespected or maligned, even for our faith or for anything. Turn the other cheek. Be like Jesus. I mean, get over it. Your pride is not all that important. In fact, your pride, pride comes before the fall, as the Proverbs say. And then verse 40, if anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. You know, so in a, on the scale of evil, we're talking about issues with cloaks and tunics. You know, it doesn't seem like a huge ordeal, but there's a lot we could go into with the cloak and tunic thing. I don't have time to develop that today. But the idea is here, you know, you just need to hold loosely to things. I mean, we, don't, don't, don't pursue trouble and, and strain relationships because of things. Things, you know, God's word says, look, what does it say? 
about us. It says we're wanderers. We're aliens. You know, we think we settled in here, but we don't. We don't. You're never settled in here. Things aren't the same as they were 10 years ago, and they certainly won't be the same 10 years from now. And we're on a journey. And, and soon, some of us won't be here anymore. And the things, you know, so we're, we're aliens and wanderers and foreigners and sojourners in this world. And the old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm not sure we really live like we believe that. We wrap our arms, our hearts, the tentacles of our hearts around things in this world, and we, we become consumed with passion and our rights about all these things that are one day, quickly, soon, in the blink of an eye, going to be gone. And it won't matter at all what you had, but it's going to matter what you did with what you had. Li you know, live with open hands. Don't make the God pry things out of your hands. Trust the Lord. The, the, the Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, that's freedom for your soul. That's freedom for you. If we can live that way, to wrap our arms around things and try to keep them, and you know, that, that's a struggle. And you're never going to win that battle because one day you're, you're going to have to let go. So <laughs> check your heart how you view things. And then... Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Again, that doesn't really seem like extreme evil to me, you know, to go a mile with somebody. It's not that far. It's not that much. Maybe somebody forces you to. They say, well, you got to do this. But there, you know, there's an old saying, right? Go the extra mile. <laughs> go a, a, above and beyond what's asked or expected. I mean... Never look at something and think, how can I do as little as possible to satisfy this situation? I used to work with guys, you know, their whole attitude was, how can I do as little as possible and make as much as I possibly can? That is just not biblical. It's not right. It's not of the Lord. Everything we do, I don't care who's asking us to do it. You know, Everything we're to do, this word says we're to do everything to the glory of God in a way of excellence. I don't care what it is. If somebody's asking you to do something and you have to, you know, give sacrificially of your time. Give sacrificially of your resources for the sake of others and the glory of God. Live, live that way. Do things with excellence. Go the extra mile. You know, Jesus is saying go the extra mile for someone who you may think is doing you evil by demanding a mile from you. Well, Give them another mile. You know, and I, you know, when you employ these things, they don't always have great outcomes, not always, but I'm telling you, by and large, there is a, 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 a wonderful outcome to living this way. Because this is the way God's told us to live. You're free from so many things when you just let these things go. Let God be God and do what you need to do. Don't, you know, well, this person mistreated me. This person said, who cares? I mean, just, do you, do you see what they did to Jesus? So, go the extra mile. In verse 42, give the one who begs from you, and don't refuse the one who would borrow from you. You know, don't look on those people with disgust or disdain. Don't, don't look at them as lesser. If you've, if you've been blessed with resources, hold them loosely. All that you have is from the Lord, and use it to bless others, even those who may have wronged you. You know, remember Romans 12, 20? It says, if your enemy is hungry, wish that he would starve to death. No, I don't know. <laughs> I've just seen if you're paying attention. <laughs> if your enemy is hungry, do what? Feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. I mean, this is, not, uh, this is not the natural way to treat those who've done evil or our enemies in, in this way. It's not the natural way. But I want to say to you, it is the way of Jesus. It's the way of the cross. 
And so as we go through this, the, the, the one thing we need to do in every relationship, in every situation of life, is keep the cross of Jesus in our mind and in our hearts. And you weigh everything against that. You weigh complaining and grumbling and whatever, and mistreatment, whatever. You weigh it against the cross of Jesus. And let that put it in perspective for you. Then this next section from verses 43 to 48, Jesus speaks about loving our enemies. You've heard it said, you shall love your, enemy and hate, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Shelby, are you leaving just because I picked on you? <laughs> you need to get over it. Did you hear what I just said? So, uh, 45, uh, Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you in 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. So that's the contrast to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Love, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. We're, we're told to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I, so I, I believe a lot of this teaching about how we treat those who do evil and enemies, I, th I think a lot of it, and you can find this, it has a lot to do with the rejection and persecution of Christians that they're going to certainly face. You know, we're to love our enemies and Pray for enemies, and we're to love our enemies and, and the enemies of Christ. Because that's exactly what God the Father has done. If Christ is our brother, if we are God's children, we're to take on the characteristics of our Father. We're to take on his nature. And so never, ever, I don't know as you ever would, but never forget, never, ever forget John 3.16. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, we, we love that verse. We should. But when did God do this? When did he give his son? Where did he send him? Who did he do it for? Did he do it for a, a bunch of people that, you know, really nice people, deserving people that are just sitting around waiting and God goes, well, and, you know, maybe I'll do it now. No, God so loved the world he sent his son. Romans 5 says, while we were still weak, while we cared nothing for God, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And for, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, so, listen, every human being, is, was an, an ungodly sinner. Everyone. Every human being was an ungodly sinner when, because of God's love, he sent Jesus to die for our sin. There's none righteous. No, not one. The word of God says we are all at enmity. We were at enmity with God. You, you get, I mean, this, this speaks of all of us. There's nobody outside of this. There's none righteous. No, not one. All of us have been at enmity with God. We've all sinned against God. We've all done evil in his sight. Evil. We've all sinned against God, done evil. Just like David said, against you and only you, only God, have I sinned. But God forgives. <laughs> the most heinous, the most wretched, the most vile of sinners. God forgives and he looks away and he removes our sin as the word says as far as the east is from the west he takes our sins that were red as scarlet and he washes them white as snow and he loves us in Christ Jesus even though we've all done evil in his sight 
And while we have all been enemies of God, he loves us and sends his son to pay the price for our sins. Then in verse 45, Jesus says, For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And he says that just after saying to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us is, is to be like our Father in heaven. Really, and as he, as he, through the cross of Jesus, offers love and forgiveness to everyone, even to all of his enemies, whosoever will, the invitation is out there to everyone. And so what's his point about the sun and the rising on the evil and the good and the just and the unjust and the rain? And Listen, it's about a lot of things. I don't have time to develop it completely, but let me just say it's a statement on the sovereignty of God. And, and it's a statement on the, on the things that go on in this world. The rain falls, listen, the rain falls on you no matter your status in life. And yeah, the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Listen, all of it's in the hands of God. All of it, everything. You do not have to sort out who deserves what or who you should love or be kind to, any of it. Because the world and everything in it is in God's hands. And, you know, so we need to trust all of it to him, everything. Every relationship, every person, everything. This is not our home. We're just passing through. The score isn't settled here. You needn't be concerned that someone's gotten away with some evil they've done to you. God holds all of that in his hands. Don't, don't, don't say to yourself, I can't love that. I could never love that person because of what they've done. Don't say that. That's an evil thing to say. Because... You know, oh, they've done such an evil thing and they're my enemy. No, you, you say to yourself, I'm going to do as Jesus has commanded. I'm going to do as Jesus has done. I'm going to seek and believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that I might love my enemies in the same manner that God has loved me. I mean, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's what Jesus is really talking about here. Loving your enemies and, and those who've done evil in the same manner in which God has loved, loved us because we have done evil and we've been enemies of God. And then verses 46 and 47, Jesus says, you know, it's one thing, in my summary, one thing to love those who love you. Anybody can do that. But to love one who has offended you and wronged you, that's of God. That's, that's the powerful witness and testimony to the power and the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life. This is the essence of the gospel. And as Stott said, this is the highest point of the whole sermon, and I believe that ultimately is because everything that's described here in, in terms of how we treat those who do evil and those who would be our enemies, all of it describes exactly what God has done for us through the cross of Jesus Christ. The gospel. You should never read this section and react to these last two contrasts that Jesus presents without looking at it in the context of the cross of Jesus Christ. We are to love others in the same manner in which God has loved us. And I, I can't make the case for it right now, but verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's said in the context of this whole discussion on loving and, and one who's done evil and loving our enemies because this is the perfect and selfless love of God. The perfect and selfless love of God. You know, we, we, we need this so desperately in our relationships today. There's so much hatred and arguing and all sorts of things going on. And, you know, this is why I said we've got to keep the cross as the focus of our life. And you, and you remember what God has done for you. And then you, re, you, you relate to others with that same sort of grace and mercy that he's applied to your life. And if you search the New Testament for passages that speak about God's love, you can scarcely find any passage that speaks of God's love without speaking of the cross. John 3.16, I've already quoted, but it says, God so loved the world that he gave. Well, you didn't just... Give us, he gave us on the cross. That's a reference to the cross, giving the life of his son. 
to pay the penalty of our sins so that whoever might believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The cross, the love of God displayed on the cross. 1 John 4.10 in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. All these references to God's love intertwined with the cross. And again, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How did Jesus treat his enemies and evildoers. That, that, that's the question. You know that, that old thing where people say, what would Jesus do, WWJD and all that? Well, that's much more than something to put on your wrist. It, 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 <laughs> it's, it's the essence of life. Like, what, what would Jesus do? You got a relationship with somebody and it's strained. And you're, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6 tells us, the Lord said, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. As Jesus was on the cross after this unthinkable, horrible, brutal beating, to the point that he was virtually unrecognizable. The humility and beating he suffered was unthinkable. And then he's nailed to a cross and he looks down from the cross. He looks down upon those who'd done these acts of evil. Talk about evil, this is evil. Putting this, the son of God, the holy one, the pure one, the righteous one on the cross from the hearts of men those who cried for his death. You know, they didn't realize they were calling for the propitiation of their sins. They just wanted him dead. And his enemies who put him there, and he, all of this has happened, and he, he, he never, he didn't ask for vengeance or retaliation. He said, Father, forgive them. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, everyone. We've all wandered and sinned against the Lord. But he is our advocate, and he intercedes for us. Intercedes, and he extends forgiveness and mercy and grace. If we truly understand the cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ, can we do any less than seek and pray for the salvation and restoration of any human being? Can we do any less than love our enemies and those who've done evil against us? Than, than the way the Lord has loved us. I mean, I, this is the heart of this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. This is, this is the pinnacle. This is the most challenging point of it all. But it also points us to the greatest news ever. It points us to the gospel of Jesus and how he has loved us. If, you, if you're struggling in some relationship, somebody you can't speak to, somebody, whatever it might be, I, I implore you on the word of God to act in grace and mercy. Extend love and grace. Pray for healing. Pray for salvation for that soul. Apply to them the same grace and mercy that's been applied to you on the cross of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, these, this is, these, these are hard words for us. I, I, I don't want to belittle some of the great offenses that people have suffered. But you, you said vengeance is yours. You, you're in control of all things, and, and we needn't be vindicated on this earth. We, we need to walk in faith and trust and, and under the reign of your grace and mercy 
And we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to set free those who've wronged us in some way, those offenses that irritate us, those, those things that we want to hang on to, all of it. Father, we, we need the supernatural power of your Holy Spirit working in our life to set us free, to live as true citizens of the kingdom that is beyond this world, that we might be agents of peace and grace and mercy, that we might be ambassadors for Christ and the gospel. Help us, Lord. And I pray for one here who may struggle today in some relationship. I pray your, your grace falls upon them and sees the freedom that you want to call them to as they extend grace and mercy to the, to, to the offender. I believe it's the only true liberty for the human soul when we do live, as Job said, with wide open hands. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Help us all the rest in your sovereign power and purposes in all things. Father, uh, <clears throat> we thank you for this challenge. Help us, help us, God, to love deeply like Jesus. Help us to seek the power of the Holy Spirit in our life every day, to love people in our lives who are otherwise unlovely, unlovable. Help us, God. We, we help us be like Jesus. Help us extend the grace and mercy that you've extended to us on the cross. May you be glorified. May we be set free. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? The hour in the spirit, the hour in the Lord, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and then know we are Christians by. Oh.